afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to the I Donation Program and Imaging Session. Um, I am very uh, proud to introduce um, Dr. Mala Malia Edwards and Dr. Ankar uh, Sawant. Um, Dr. Malia Edwards uh, is an assistant professor at the Wilmer Eye Institute, John, Johns Hopkins University, Maryland. She and her lab are currently investigating how early in the disease process Muller cell changes occur and how their activation and remodeling affects AMD disease progression by influencing blood vessels, neurons, and retinal pigment epithelial cells. Thank you for joining us this weekend, Dr. Edwards. Uh, Dr. Sawant received a doctorate in biomedical sciences and master's in biotechnology from Texas A&M University. He completed a post postdoctoral fellowship at the Cleveland Clinic Cole Eye Institute and was named a 2018 Emerging Vision Scientist by the National Alliance for Eye and Vision Research. Today, he's here to talk about Eversight. Eversight is a nonprofit organization with a mission to restore sight and prevent blindness through the healing power of donation, transplantation, and research. The Eversight Network is responsible for recovering, evaluating, and providing human eye tissue for transplantation, um, supporting research into causes and cures of blinding eye conditions, promoting donation awareness through public and professional education, and providing humanitarian aid to people around the world in need of corneal transplantation. Thank you both for being here. I don't think it is. Can I use it? Is this mic on? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for that introduction. And thank you for the Croydoremia Foundation for giving me a chance to present to you today a little bit of the importance of eye donations and a little bit of the work that we're doing in our lab and why it's important to us as researchers to, to get eye donations from donors. First of all, I just want to emphasize that as scientists, the way we view donations to us, studying, eye, studying donor eyes is really a privilege. And that's something that I can't overstate as a scientist. Okay, sorry, oh, closer, okay. And I just want you to know, we realize that making that decision to, for, don't, for patients and when you become a donor to, and their families, we realize that when you make that decision, that that's a important decision and that you are entrusting eyes to us as researchers. And as such, especially with the case, cases such as choroideremia, where those eye, eye tissue is so rare for us to receive, we really work to get as much as we possibly can from each donation. And we really see that as a privilege to work with these eyes. But there's no, really no better way that we can understand what's happening in the human disease than to look at human eyes. You've heard a lot about animal models and stem cell models. And while these are fantastic, they simply don't exactly mimic what's happening in the human eyes because in most cases, and a mouse will live two years. A human with choroideremia will you know, live for 70 to 80 to 90 years. So obviously there's a much longer pathological process. So by looking really at human eyes, we can get a better understanding of what's really happening in the disease. So just to give you a little bit of an overview, you probably have all seen this, but the parts of the human eye, I was going to, I was going to try a pointer, but I guess I really, can you see the mouse or no? Yeah. Okay. So the parts of the eye that we're really interested in are the, at the back of the eye. So the retina here and the choroid, and these are the parts of the eye where the neurons are and the vasculature. And this is the part that's important to my lab as researchers and the cornea, when we receive the eyes, we remove the cornea and the lens. So what happens when we get an eye in the lab? As I mentioned, we take off the anterior chamber, which is the cornea and the, the lens. And this allows us to see the back of the eye clearly. On the left here is an image of a normal, so let me take images with a um, microscope. And what we see on the left is a normal, this is a normal eye. The two eyes on the right are from two eyes that our lab has been fortunate enough to receive from eyes of choroideremia patients. As you can see, the picture is much different and there's large scar formation and a lo uh, loss of the vessels. 
So this is the first picture we see, and this is similar to what a clinician would see um, when you go to the when you go to the, when you go to the eye doctor, and they just look through a in, through a um, indirect ophthalmoscope. So what we usually do when we sorry when we receive the eyes, what we usually do is we will take one eye, and we will do what's called cryopreservation. We will take the eye and put it through a series of solutions that allow us to preserve the tissue exactly as it is. And then we freeze it into different little blocks. And we're able to then use um, what's known as a cryostat or a sectioner to then go through and we can look at in one section, in one, one piece of tissue, we can look at all the different layers. So this is the retina and the choroid in sections. So you have multiple layers of neurons and here's your, photo, your RPE cells down here and your choroid. So we can look at this all in one, P, in one section. Within these sections, we can stain these to look at where specific proteins are expressed. Sometimes this changes in different diseases. We can look at how different cells, whether cells stay in their same location or they shift locations. And we can also look at um, how these different cells are affected. We can look at increases or decreases in protein expression, which again just helps us understand that disease pathology. Within these sections, we can also look at healthy areas versus non-healthy areas of the same tissue. And within a hum one human eye, we can look at numerous proteins because each section, each of these sections, we can stain with up to four different up to four different proteins at one time using fluorescent microscopy. So this is just an image of what one, an example of one of the stains that we do. On the left is a normal tissue from a normal donor. And the stains here are red and green. So the red is the, gli the glial cells. These are the cells that my lab is interested in. And they're shown here in, in the normal. We only see these at the very top of the, this particular staining, we normally only see at the very top of the retina. And you have your photoreceptors shown here in green. In our choroideremia donor shown here on the right, you can see the picture is much different. We see this red staining throughout, these, throughout the entire retina, and the green staining is only very small punctate areas that are left. And this is an example of one of the things we see that clinicians can't see, because we see this image tells us that these glial cells are undergoing drastic remodeling, and they're becoming very activated which again is gonna, when they, these particular cells become activated, which happens early in the disease, we think, they start to release things that can contribute to the pathology of the disease. And it also tells us that there's a lot of what's known as remodeling and changes in the, pro, in the structures of the cells within the retina. One thing you might also notice is if you look at the blue staining, in the control, you have very nice layering, but we've lost that in the choroideremia donor. Again, these are very advanced stages, and this is the end stage of the disease, but it does give us some picture as to what's happening um, throughout the disease process and something that clinicians, while we clinicians can speculate what may be happening to the Mueller cells, you really can't see that without looking in a human eye. And these changes, again, in a patient are going to be happening over decades compared to in an animal model where it's going to be happening within a couple, one, you know, sometimes less than a year. So within the other eyes, what we usually do are take, we separate the retina and choroid. So we actually take them and dissect the retina away from the choroid. And this allows us to visualize, so we can take it and we make what are called flat mounts. And we actually take the retina out and lay this flat. And we can actually visualize the, each part of the retina in, as an entire structure. At different, so we can look at the different layers. Using what's known as a confocal microscope, we can go through and look at each layer um, as itself and then go down those layers that I showed you. I'll show you a picture of this in a moment. Um, but this allows us to give, gets us, gives us spatial recognition, spatial mapping of the changes that we see. And at the same time, we can then, after we image them in this perspective, we go and then cryopreserve them so we can also look at them in the, cryo, in the cross section. Again, this is just our way of really getting the most out of the tissue. So this is an example of what we see when we look at a flat mount. This is of a retina of, a, of the retina and the choroid. Um, what happens in choroideremia often is there's a large scar that forms between the retina and the choroid. So when we dissect them, we can't always separate the two tissues. 
So what's shown here, these images are taken again on that confocal microscope that I mentioned. And this microscope is, allows us to image, um, we can do, as I mentioned, go through different layers of the, of the retina and the choroid. So you t it takes a picture and then it moves down a little bit into the next focal plane. So it goes through and takes an image throughout the, th throughout the tissue. So we can get the entire depth of the tissue, but different, different pictures at each layer. What it also allows us to do is do tiled images. So these pictures that you see are actually the same picture just with different channels taken out. But what we're actually looking at is a map of the entire macular block of an eye with choroideremia. So it's a 25 different images that are taken by the microscope so it moves across and lets us see a nice map of the tissue. And one of the things this also emphasizes here, the red and the green are both markers for glial cells. And what we find in eyes with choroideremia is that there's a glial mem a membrane that forms above the retina and also a membrane that forms below. Um, again, just demonstrating that remodeling of these cells. And then the white staining here is the vasculature within the retina. And this, again, is a way that we can look at the pathology. We can go and then measure the percent that's covered by vas the percent vascular area, the percent of the tissue that has normal vasculature, and compare this to normal, normal, normal donors, and also go and compare in different stages if we had that. This is an example of what we see when we look at the choroid of eyes with choroideremia. Again, these are those large tiled maps, and it really helps us to define the pathology. On the top is the choroid of a normal donor, and on the bottom is the choroid from a choroideremia donor. And what you can see is there's obviously much less choroidal vessels in the choroideremia donor. But what we can do with this is go and look at finer, er smaller areas. And we can also look at areas within these flat mounts where we may have some preservation, and I'll show you that in a moment. Another pretty cool thing that we can do with um, the flat mount tissue is we can create 3D images. I apologize, this was supposed to be a movie, but it won't play um, with this. It's not compatible with this computer. But what we can do is take these, when we take our images on the confocal microscope, we can go through all the layers of the retina, and then we can, with computer imaging, put this into a special software that then allows us to twist and turn the tissue so that we can look at the different the interactions of the cells more. And you can hopefully appreciate here, if you look at these red cells, you can see where the cells that are on top of the retina are actually interacting with cells within the retina. So we can really appreciate cell, in cellular to cellular interactions. And these are two different types of cells that we've stained in addition to the blood vessels within these tissues. So this is just another thing that we can do with this um, whole mounts. Sorry, there we go. So the whole mounts also allow us to see entire individual cells within the choroid and the retina, and we can look at them at much higher magnification. So these, again, are the glial cells, and the blue is the blood vessels. And this just lets us understand more what's happening to individual cells. We can look at changes in cellular shape, changes in cellular location. And all of this, again, is in an entire image of the eye, and then we can embed it later. This shows us um, ways that we can correlate the retina and the choroidal pathology. So in this case, we have the retina. We can take the retina from right on top of the choroid and image it. And what you can see, if you can see on the far right here, or the, sorry, the far left, we have an area here where these little blue um, kind of like circles that you see are actually RPE cells that have been preserved in the far periphery of this patient with choroideremia. And when we go into the next, so this, and this, is, this is one focal plane. So this is one of those layers on the microscope. And then when we go into the deeper layers, this is the same section, the same tissue, but we've just gone down a layer on the microscope. So we can see an entirely different picture, and we can see that the choriocapillaris vessels are actually still intact in this area where the RPE cells are still intact. So while that doesn't tell us whether the RPE go first or the choroid, it does tell us that when we have both in place, they are both, you know, at least they are in, um, somewhat healthy. Um, so that's just one picture we can see. 
We can also view, again, full cells. And this is more of a normal picture, what we would expect to see. And this, again, are these abnormal cells that we see migrating onto the surface of the retina in choroideremia eyes. Then we also see this in other retinal degenerations, such as retinitis pigmentosa, and in some cases in AMD. Another thing we do with um, our, image, our eyes that come in is we usually take a small piece and use them for what's known as transmission electron microscopy. Now, while with the confocal microscope, we can look at individual cells, with the transmission electron mi microscope, we can actually look at ultrastructurally at the individual cells and see very small changes within these cells. We can see accumulation of protein, changes to mitochondria, changes to the cell transport, and actually junctions. Be we can look at interactions between two cells, looking at their junctions. So it really allows us to get, you know, down at the ultra-structural level. And again, this is how we can understand the disease better. And in some cases, not usually with choroideremia because the tissue is so rare, but we can actually culture cells from the human eyes that we receive. And this allows us to look at specifically how specific cell types um, respond to different conditions without the influence of other cells which again, similar to the iPSC cells, is a way that we can understand disease pathology and progression. So just an overview of what we can, information we can get from the donor eyes. The donor eyes, again, help us to better understand the pathology and reveal cellular changes that clinicians can't see. And one thing that I didn't mention is that in some cases, we've been fortunate enough to have um, medical history of the donors whose eyes we've received, and we've actually had clinical images. And this really, if you have those clinical images, and then we can compare that to what we see um, histologically, that really gives us an amazing understanding of what might be happening. Because in some cases, there's things happening. Clinicians may see something on the OCT or on the fundus images, but not quite know what it is. But then when we really look at the pathology, we can get a better understanding of exactly what we're seeing there. Um, by studying human donor eyes, we can really develop better models and help to identify the specific cell types that may play a role in the disease. I think there's often more cells at play than we, you know, there's your primary targets, but there's other cells that are likely involved and play an important role in the disease pathology. And we can help to identify these molecular and cellular changes that may provide new possibilities for treating the disease. One thing that I think is really important to stress, especially in conditions, um, in cases like choroideremia, is the importance of looking at female carriers. The donor eyes that we receive from affected males are obviously extremely important and interesting, and they're very beneficial. Unfortunately, they're providing us a picture of the disease that's usually at the end stage of the disease. So it helps us understand changes, but it really tells us the end. And to better understand the pathology, we need to understand what's happening more towards the middle where we can better understand how to prevent the disease. And looking at female carriers um, who may be at different stages of the disease or earlier in the progression, I think will really help us gain greater insights um, into the, into the patho pathophysiology of the disease. Um, just to, to overstate this, um, I really don't think I can overemphasize that eye donations are so important to understanding disease pathology, and this is truly a way that an individual can help future patients and leave a lasting legacy. And as researchers, again, I just want to stress that we are extremely grateful to eye donors and their families for helping us to understand retinal and choroidal diseases. Um, I would just like to acknowledge, um, first of all, the eye donors who have donated their eyes to our lab that we have been fortunate enough to look at and their families, and also the members of my lab, um, in particular my late mentor, Jerry Luddy, who many of you um, may have known. He was pretty active with choroideremia, and he got me involved um, with studying the choroideremia tissue and with choroideremia eyes and really opened my eyes to the importance of eye donations. So I, with that, I will pass it on to... Ankar, or do you, want to, do you want me to take questions and then, okay. Yes, if there's any questions. Yep. Oh. <laughs> hi, hi, thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm aware of, uh, like in New York State, you sign your driver's license, you're an organ donor. 
But my concern is if that happens to me tomorrow, I hope it doesn't, <laughs> I'm not sure my eyes would, not that you want my eyes, but let's say, and my family members are affected, how do we make sure that you get the donations you need if people are willing? So Ankar will be talking more about that. And they do have, there is a form on the Croydoremia website which does you can fill out and we'll have the eyes directed to my lab and one of the things with the international choroideremia research network is that we're trying to really understand who you know what labs want to look at the tissue to make sure that we're preserving the eyes so not just my lab but other research labs also have access to that tissue okay. i will pass it over to ankar Thanks. All right, let's see this. Can you hear me okay? Awesome, good afternoon everybody. Um, just want to thank uh, Cradermia Research Foundation uh, giving this invitation to speak here. Uh, honored to be here and doing this session with Dr. Edward. Um, let's see. My name is Omkar Savant. I'm Director for Research and Innovations at Eversight. And uh, as it was mentioned by John, Eversight is one of the iBank. Uh, we are located in a state of Michigan, Illinois, Ohio, uh, and New Jersey. Uh, we also have some operation in New England region, uh, as well as we have office in Seoul, South Korea as well. Uh, so as you can see in this map, uh, it shows our location, uh, but also shows the uh, orange dot, shows the different location where we distribute tissue uh, mainly for corneal transplantation. Uh, we like to start all of our presentation uh, with our mission. Uh, so our mission is to restore sight and prevent blindness through the healing power of donation, transplantation, and research. Uh, so for this presentation, uh, my goal is to really educate you all uh, about a little bit more on eye banking operations. Uh, so what really goes when we take the tissue, how that process happened, so we can help our surgeon for corneal transplantation, but also help our researcher to understand the diseases more. Uh, then we'll look a little bit more into what the role eye banks play in the corneal transplantation and research and what that operation looks like. Uh, and at the last, I wanna share, if we have enough time, just quick example, how we use donated eyes to understand one of the other orphan diseases. And it really, uh, opened our understanding about different genetic diseases. Um, so for this crowd, I'm sure you all are aware, uh, and this is like a very basic cartoon of uh, eye cross-section. Uh, as you can see, uh, the retina and RP layer is in the back, uh, connected to the posterior segment of the eye. Uh, but front of the eye, essentially window to the eye, is cornea, uh, which is the clear, uh, clear structure mainly consists of collagen that allows light to pass and fall onto those photoreceptors. So as a corneal transplantation, it's the most common uh, and successful form of transplantation. Uh, eyes are the most frequently donated tissue. So if you look among all tissue and eye donation community, eye is the most donated uh, tissue and organ. Uh, surgery can be scheduled as an elective procedure in United States. Uh, we are fortunate enough uh, in United States, most of the Europe and Australia, that we have well uh, oiled machine for eye banking and there is no wait list. Like if you need corneal transplantation, you can go schedule that very easily. Uh, but a lot of part of this world, especially in Asia and Africa, uh, there is shortage of donor tissue. Um, and many patients can say uh, there are hundreds and thousands of people that has improved quality of life right after corneal transplantation. Uh, and just as an example, uh, so you can see how quickly corneal transplantation can improve your quality of life by curing 
the corneal blindness. Uh, so the image on left is before transplantation. You can see this patient had severe uh, corneal opacity and there is a cloudiness within the cornea. Uh, and then two days after corneal transplantation, you can see this is a full thickness corneal transplantation. Almost in the center, you can see some of the remnant sutures, uh, but you can, I hope you can appreciate there is a crystal clear cornea that allows light to pass completely. Uh, so it's a remarkable, these patients have a life-changing change in their vision overnight. Uh, so for if you look closely for US eye banking operation, uh, in 2021, uh, there were about 64,000 eye donors within the United States. From those eye donors, about 80,000 corneal transplantation grafts were provided all across the world. Uh, so if you think about that, that just 80,000 people within a year that had their corneal blindness uh, cured. And it's a very successful process. 95% of the corneal transplantation are successful. Uh, in this red box, uh, kind of wanted to denote how many different tissues, uh, eye tissues, has been used for education, training, and research as well. Uh, so last year, about 22,000 tissues were used for education, research, and training. Uh, just as an impact of Eversight, uh, last year we uh, procured tissue from about 6,600 donors and creating surgical transplantation graph for 8,500 recipients. And at the same time, we provided 4,000 tissue. Those are different ocular tissue, cornea, retina, RPE, uh, for about 4,000 different uh, research projects. Uh, so going a little bit more in understanding what the cycle of giving really looks like. Uh, so it, this really starts with when someone is in a need and a charitable gift has been made. Uh, once the tissue is recovered, it is come back to the lab for evaluation. After the evaluations are done, uh, we designate for which type of corneal transplantation this tissue could be used. Once that all assessment has been done, Tissue gets sent to our surgeon where uh, surgery is already scheduled and then it gets used for transplantation purposes. So if you look more a little bit uh, in the clinical outflow uh, workflow of the operation, as I mentioned, the process starts when there is a notification for the death. Then there is a screening for donor. Uh, then the authorization is obtained from each and every uh, donor family. Then the recovery is performed simultaneously we do the serological testing because we want to make sure the recipient is safe and secure. And at the, during same time, tissue evaluations are also performed. Uh, then tissue is stored for about four to five days before it's processed and then transported to the uh, surgery center. So after tissue processing, uh, tissue is placed, distributed, and then uh, further follow-up is done. Uh, so for uh, this presentation, we'll talk a little bit about what that consent process works and how the donor uh, screening uh, takes place. So anytime there is a death, uh, according to the Centers for Medicare and uh, Medicaid Service Conditions, uh, participation is required every hospital to report every death uh, upon to the organ procurement organization. So within United States, each state has uh, state-funded organ procurement organization. Uh, so they receive the death referral, and then based upon whether it's an eye donor, tissue donor, or organ donor, case is channeled in different uh, organization. So if it's only eye donor, the case comes directly to the eye bank. So once we receive the referral at the eye bank, there is a thorough donor screening that takes place. Uh, and we're not going to go in details about each different step, uh, but just want to highlight that some of the questions that we ask to donor families. Uh, so we make sure that there is no systemic infection uh, or any communicable diseases such as HIV, hepatitis, et cetera. Uh, we also screen for high-risk behavior, uh, and we also need to make sure we have qualified blood sample that can be used for serological testing. Uh, unfortunately, right now, as per FDA uh, regulation, any of the degenerative uh, neurological diseases are not eligible to uh, donate their tissue for corneal transplantation. So we ask questions related to that 
Uh, we also secure history related to different cancers, uh, physical condition, trauma that has been associated. Uh, once all these criteria are screened, uh, then we uh, secure the authorization. So authorization can be a first person authorization, uh, which supersedes ev every authorization, and there can be next of kin authorization as well. So uh, this authorization can be uh, secured through a in person Recording or in progress. That was nice. <laughs> um, so authorization can be in person or in phone or uh, can be done in a hospital setting as well. So interview is conducted by our call center, and this is done with somebody that knows the most about the donor or potential donor. Uh, so these questionnaires are similar to one could be asking for the blood donation, but they are more in depth. We also screen for current as well as past medical and social history. And all these questionnaires are requirement for FDA. If we do not have any of this information, FDA does not allow us to use that corneal tissue for transplantation. Uh, so as I mentioned, there can be different uh, combinations of donations. Uh, a donor can be eye-only donor, it can be tissue and eye donor, organ, tissue and eye donor, or organ and eye donor. So based on what their classification is, it affects how our operation works. And then when it comes to the intent of the recovery, it can be uh, just surgical intent. That means tissue will be used only for corneal transplantation. Uh, it can be research only consent. So tissue can be used only for research or it can be a dual intent as well. And we'll talk a little bit more about this. Um, and then uh, there are some efforts to build registry as well. This is a hard topic, uh, but there can be a registry that always helps us to keep track of different diseases. Uh, so as I mentioned, there are three types of eye recoveries that we do. Uh, surgical intent recovery, which involves we taking cornea only. So as I mentioned, cornea is the front part of the eye. The rest of the globe just sits there. Uh, next is surgical intent enucleation. So sometimes we have authorization for surgical purpose but we have also authorization to take the whole eye. So that process is called enucleation. And then the third one is research intent. Uh, so in that case, we can take entire eye, process it for different research purpose, as Dr. Edward mentioned earlier. So when we do that uh, surgical intent recovery, uh, just wanted to share an example how that tissue looks like. Uh, so what we are seeing uh, in these two images is the cornea. That's the front part of the eye attached to the sclera, uh, kept in this specialized chamber uh, with a special media that helps nourish, nourish the tissue while it's stored before processing for corneal transplantation. So once the surgical intent recovery is done and the tissue is sitting in this chamber, uh, our role is to evaluate the tissue before we process it for transplantation based on what our uh, ophthalmologists have asked us. Uh, so we perform specular microscopy, which looks at one type of cells within the cornea. Uh, we also do the slit lamp biomicroscopy, which is more as a qualitative assessment. Uh, and then third is optical coherence tomography, which allows us to look at the thickness of the tissue. So based on all these criteria, we determine for which type of corneal transplantation that tissue is suitable. Uh, so during all this process, tissue is mainly stored uh, in a corneal preservation media, which is at 2 to 8 degrees Celsius. Uh, we also save tissue, a uh, very small amount of tissue in different condition. Uh, it can be in paraformaldehyde or some different reagent that is required for research purpose. Uh, so during the tissue processing, we cut the tissue based on different criteria that surgeons have submitted to us. Uh, so just to give you a quick example, not trying to go in detail of this process, but you can see on the cartoon on the right side, uh, that is a cornea. And based on what that red patch is, that is a surgical graph. So if the cornea is affected throughout, we replace the complete cornea, uh, but it's only one of the those five layers. We selectively prepare tissue, and then our surgeon perform the selective surgery. Uh, the benefit of doing partial transplantation 
is you need less immunosuppression. More tissue transplanted, it requires more dependency on steroids. So all this work happens within the eye banking setup and then we prepare the tissue that goes to the surgeon directly. Um, and then these are just some of the examples of different corneal transplantation graft that we uh, supply. So going back to that uh, eye banking operation, as I mentioned, this is how tissue look like when we do that surgical intent corneal recovery uh, that is used only for transplantation. But we can also do research intent only recovery or we can do dual intent recovery. Uh, so as you can see on the left, this chamber with this pink fluid in it is how the tissue or the cornea is stored for about period of 10 to 14 days. Uh, the container in between is just a regular eye jar, uh, but that is used for our research intent recoveries. And then the, this device on the right side is called the REV1 device. It's a FDA approved device that allows us to do dual purpose recovery. So what we can do is we can take the donated eyes, use the cornea for corneal transplantation so that donor can help somebody see today. And then we can use the rest of the eye for research purpose that will help us solve blindness in different uh, conditions such as retina for long term. Here's one example uh, about how we do uh, some of the dissection. So as you can see on the, this image on left, uh, that's a whole eye nucleation. Uh, the globe is sitting in an eye jar with a special fluid. Um, and then on the right top side, we are showing the picture of how the dissection take place. So just a snapshot of that. And then eventually we separate all different layers of the tissue and they are stored in the freezer for molecular biology work. As Dr. Edward talked about earlier and showed different images, we can also process tissue for histology purposes. Uh, so within our eye banking setup, we can either make cryo blocks uh, and preserve that tissue long term. Uh, we can also make paraffin block as you can see here in between. And then sections can be made and put on a slide and observe under the microscope. So this image on the right, we are looking at the cross section of retina. You can see nice uh, outer nuclear layer, inner nuclear layer, and RPE photoreceptor. So it allows us to do that uh, microscopic evaluation of the tissue. Uh, so what is the really purpose of donated research eye? Uh, it really allows us to do the microscopic characterization of the tissue, helps it understand how the disease is affecting the eye, and perhaps uh, increase our understanding of that disease. And now, uh, just kind of quickly share an example uh, of some of the recent work that we have been doing for uh, MPS3C. It's an orphan disease, uh, uh, extremely rare. It's autosomal recessive disease caused by mutation in gene called SGSNAT. So in this work, uh, this work has been done in collaboration with Cleveland Clinic, uh, Phoenix Nest, which is a Brooklyn-based biotech company, and then University of Montreal. Uh, so what we see in this disease, uh, so these are the images from mouse model. Uh, as you can see on the left side here, that's a healthy mouse eye. Uh, the blue band here, that's the outer nuclear layer. That's the nuclei of photoreceptors. And then on the right side is the MPS3C affected eye from a litter mate um, of that mouse colony. Uh, so you can see this outer nuclear layer is much thinner uh, in the MPS3C model compared to the control, indicating that there is a severe rod degeneration in this mouse model. Uh, so the, the novelty of this work is uh, this phenotype is much younger in the age. So MPS3C patient has severe brain damage but that brain damage does not show up in a mouse model till the mouse is eight months old. But we were able to see these phenotypes even at the six month of that age. So essentially we were able to use eye as a model for the early diagnostic. Uh, so when we looked at the photo uh, cone photoreceptors, we didn't see any alteration. So it was selectively affecting only rod photoreceptors. Um, luckily we were fortunate enough to have a MPS3C donor that had donated their eyes for us to correlate the mouse phenotype to human eyes. Uh, so as you can see in the peripheral retina, uh, shown by these red arrows here, uh, the top panel here, that's from the healthy control eye, and then the lower panel here is from the MPS3C patient. 
Uh, I hope you can recognize the photoreceptor thickness in the top panel is much thicker than the panel lower. Uh, so peripherally, we saw the same phenotype as we were seeing in the mouse model, uh, but centrally, the phenotype looked completely different. It did not show us what we were seeing in the mouse model. So that made us kind of question our mouse model a little bit, uh, because the mouse is different than what, who we are. Uh, so this helped us to really ask this question, how uh, MPS3C eyes are affected in young patients. Uh, so uh, we collaborate with somebody that has their son has this disease as well. Uh, and these are images from Jonah. When Jonah was 11 years old, uh, I just watched a video a few days ago from Jonah's mother that she sent me. He's 16 year old now. Uh, but these are the images from a couple of years ago when we saw uh, he had a phenotype which was completely different than what mouse model was shown. Uh, so he had a severe uh, uh, macular edema, which is different than the rod photoreceptor degeneration that we were seeing at the periphery. Uh, so at this age, his vision was perfect. He was able to see 2025, but because of the looking into mouse model, looking into the cadaveric donated eyes, we were able to have more awareness uh, for this community to really understand uh, what this disease might be affecting the eye even before it affects the brain. Uh, so in summary, the message that uh, we are trying to tell is the eyes are really windowed through the brain and there is a quite a bit of awareness about how we could use retina as a biomarker for uh, some of the brain diseases as well. Uh, so with, through this example, uh, we are now using eye evaluation as an early ophthalmic evaluation and diagnostic for the MPS3C gene therapy that might be starting in future soon. Um, so with that, I just want to quickly wrap up uh, and really stress again how important it is to understand the disease phenotype and pathology in donated eyes. And if any of you are interested in finding out and going back to your question, uh, how to find uh, an eye bank near you, uh, you can go on this website, which is maintained by iBank Association of America. Uh, it's called restoresite.org slash find an eye bank. Uh, you can enter uh, the name of your state, wherever you are located, and it will list the eye bank near you. Uh, so this is just an example showing uh, finding an Eversight in Michigan location. Uh, so if you're interested knowing more about the eye donation process, I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, I left few printouts there uh, for all the eye banks in United States, and I left my business card there as well. If you have any questions, happy to take any questions. Uh, our goal is really to promote research through eye donation so we can understand the disease more. Uh, so if you have any questions, please reach out. Uh, with that, really want to acknowledge uh, Foundation for giving opportunity to present here. Uh, really appreciate eye donor families for uh, doing the donation. Uh, Everstrife staff, it's a complicated operations of eye banking. It's a tricky topic. We deal with uh, death and families, so big thanks to them to make this uh, operation working. And then our transplantation surgeon, researchers, and scientists, uh, and appreciate our philanthropic support from different funders. So. With that, this is my information. If somebody wants to note down, but happy to take any questions. Thank you. Is there anybody or any part of a choroideremia sufferer's eye that can be used to help other patients? That's a great question. So I was looking in literature if cornea could be used for transplantation, and there was not much literature. Um, I, and I, I think it's a healthy cornea. So uh, if we donate the whole eye with the dual intent recovery, we could secure the cornea and use for corneal transplantation. So then we know that at least two people can be gifted from that gift, and the rest of the eye could be still used for research purpose. So there is that um, multi-purpose we can achieve, yes. And also kind of uh, want to mention uh, with our MPS3C work, uh, we found out that the carriers also have a quite a bit phenotype as well. So it's not only the person that has both copies of the mutation, but even the carriers have some mild symptoms as well. So it will be interesting to even study what that uh, phenotype of single mutation looks like. Yeah. She needs a mic. 
Hi, thanks again. Do you find, um, I used to have to, I was a nursing supervisor years ago, and it used to be my job to ask people for, for organ and, and transplant. Yeah. This was years ago. We have a better system now. Do you find that some cultures or some approachers were better than others? Because now we just, um, in, I, live in, I live in this area, and the call goes directly to uh, an eye bank person mm -hmm. uh, or like a, a tissue donation bank. Yeah. So in your experience, is there a best way to procure tissue donation, whether eye or other ways? Yeah, so if you are interested in, in donating your eyes and if you want to call ahead, uh, the best way it to, is to get in touch with the eye bank uh, ahead of time, give them an idea. Uh, and most of the eye bank are always willing to help make sure the tissue goes to the appropriate researcher or scientist. And also, as Dr. Edward mentioned, I think on the website there is a form that you can submit. So yes. I'll Nothing. just add to that, too, that I think it's important to mention that even normal donors are important because that gives us something for comparison. And I think one thing that's very important is to make sure if you are interested in donating your tissue is that your family is aware of that. And if you fill out those forms ahead of time, because as researchers, the faster we get the eyes, the better. And I have seen numerous times, and I'm sure Ankar has as well, where someone has the wish to donate their eyes but then when it comes down to the family signing that form at the last minute as you mentioned the family says no so then that tissue cannot be used because in the, ultimately it's the family's decision so just having while it's an uncomfortable conversation it's you know important to make your wishes known i think so yeah planning ahead is a good idea a question though just picking up on you said you want normal tissues as well um can you designate a normal healthy tissue for research as opposed to going off to, you know, just the general public? And is that possible? Yes. Uh, so we can still use rest of the eye, so the retina posterior segment for research as a control for choroidemia research and still use the healthy cornea for transplantation. Uh, one caveat there is right now, 75 year old is the cutoff for corneal transplantation in United States. So most eye bank would not use any tissue that's older than 75 years old, uh, but that's changing slowly. Uh, our eye bank recently moved that limit to 80 uh, years old. And that is because as you age, the suitability of your tissues goes down. So when we recover any tissue, uh, out of 100 tissue, only 60% of the cornea gets used for transplantation. Other 40 corneas fall off from that surgical path because of different medical condition or tissue not being suitable. So that tissue still gets used for research, but as you, we stretch the age, that rate even goes down more. Thank you.